Folks, I'm Kamal Alawalia. Uh, recently joined a company called Ikigai Labs. We have a platform for building AI app for enterprises. You're all in love with LLMs, which are fantastic. Under the hood, what we have is large graph models, which are better suited to solve the quantitative issues and working with sparse, limited, spatial, uh, tabular data that you find in enterprises. So a lot of the research comes from MIT. And the second thing, I'll actually skip the fun fact. I'll actually share something else. Uh, this is something that Rika and I share passionately. I'm encouraged to see plenty of women in this room. And I think how we take women along with us on this AI journey as everything changes is upon all of us. All right, that was a round of applause in fact. All right. <laughs> okay. And I learned a lot about that in the last five years, but that's something that I'll put on the table that five years from now, we should have several women billionaires who have leveraged AI to actually generate wealth for themselves and for others. That would be the mark of us doing well, and all these models will take care of themselves. Hi, I'm Amelia Lin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Honeycomb. I'm very much a fan of this plan. I plan to become a billionaire like this. <laughs> and uh, we're a generative AI startup, uh, and we do family photography powered by generative um, AI. Uh, I see a couple of familiar faces in the room as we were also uh, hosting our own events during us on Tech Week. It was lovely to see a few of you with those. And um, let's see, what else? Fun fact. Fun fact. Um, okay, I don't have two. One is very relevant to this audience. Okay, so I like to do a lot of community buildings type stuff for fun and very relevant to this audience. I also run Gen AI Founders. Um, which was the first Slack community started for founders building and generative AI. So I think there might be some people in this room who are interested in that group. You can find us on Twitter and um, join there. It's a really great group of people, a um, couple members here. And then the second fun fact I guess I would say is that we were just featured in the New York Times this week as a top app for new parents. So <laughs> it's been a lucky week for me to come. That's wonderful. I think by the way, she, she also knows that she has another community she fosters, which is DC Pack Moms. So I think it's again very thematic in terms of what we're discussing. Hi, I'm Alex. Um, I'm co founder of Zebra, and we feel that the work in the It's a uh, pretty charming I'm excited about the opportunity and this is my plan to do it. And congrats. Um, it's not technically a plan, but I'm probably pregnant. And I stayed all the way from here just last week. All right, so round out the introductions. I'm Vlachem Royan, uh, SVP of uh, product and design and product marketing at uh, Observe AI. I joined uh, a couple months ago, and uh, it's been a whirlwind. Generative AI, the amount that it's taken off over the course of the last couple of months, uh, the impact of it, which I'm sure we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, uh, has been absolutely astounding. And so, uh, just a quick fun fact about me. Uh, my name, Mache, it's, it's an Armenian name, actually. But when I go to Canada or France, everybody thinks I'm a cow because it, you know, they look at it and go, oh, hey, Bosh, how's it going? So the immigration officers always have a lot of fun with me as a result. That's my fun fact. Amazing. All right. So as you can see, we have a star panel with very, very different Chinese perspectives. We have two who um, actually recently jumped in share with Jenny Ai, and maybe your previous ones also had a big Jenny Ai theme. And then you have two founders um, here. So maybe, Katya, you can continue with you. As you think about a company and an enterprise that's ready to capture this, the, the value uh, and realize the potential of Gen AI, what, what do you look for? Yeah, I mean, as in... And 
are all companies ready is a related question. I was really surprised by the pace at which some really big companies like the Adobe, you know, weeks they have new products. So what does it take? I think it takes exactly the buy in commitment to say that we're going to go and invest in this area with respect to generative AI. I know it sounds very simple, but highly complicated. So I was previously a larger company, and the level of investment that's actually required in order to get something off the ground to say that, you know what, we're going to set aside an engineering team and a product team that's going to focus directly on generative AI. Sometimes it's a very difficult thing to do. You have customer commitments as your company grows. You know, you have more and more customer demands that come in, it starts dominating your roadmap, so what do you do? And I think some of these companies have found a way to be nimble, quite surprisingly actually, have found a way to be nimble to say, if we don't do something here, then we're going to be massively left behind. And I think that you're seeing, uh, you know, some very companies like the Adobe's, the moves that Microsoft has made, etc., because they say, if we don't do this, then we're going to be in a lot of trouble a year or two down the road. Great. So, you know, I think we saw the show of hands that are many founders in this room. We'll talk more about how Gen AI is impacting how you serve your customers and the products. But if we stick for a few minutes on how is it changing internally in terms of how you're building companies, because we have a lot of founders here who are trying to grapple with that. In fact, at um, Virtual, our next hackathon is actually our AI hackathon where we are all going to look at each of our functions, finance, marketing, and see where are we in that journey. So we'd love to maybe talk about building a company and how is it that you use Gen AI uh, and AI probably. Uh, so we're a team of three, and we manage quite a lot as a team of three. And so what that means is that we're looking for any possible way to be more efficient and give ourselves superpowers. Um, so I would say generative AI has been really, really uh, important for us in our workflows. As an example, so one of the things we learned at Honeycomb was um, we actually have pretty large uh, social channels. So that's, what, that's how a lot of people find out about us. Um, our TikTok account has over 50 million lifetime views. And uh, we make all that content ourselves in-house. It is not powered through ads. <laughs> and so you might be like, wow, that is a lot of content that you guys are making. How are you generating uh, that many views a week? And uh, ChatGPT helps us a lot with script generation, right? We know what our audience likes. We're able to say, hey, here's past 10 videos that we've made that have gone viral and have over a million views each. Um, you know, give us more ideas and we'll look through those. And that vastly accelerates uh, our process on our machine for how we do content generation and therefore powers our signups. Such a great, such a great example. And then we jump to, I know you come from AI as company, and then to AI company. Talk to us more about that journey as well. Yeah, the thing that uh, I'm very excited about is five years ago, four years ago, when we were pitching our AI platform, you could just see in people's eyes, I mean, their eyes would roll over, they didn't understand half the stuff. And then half the time, they were too embarrassed to ask again. And then after a few weeks, when you heard the same question third time, you knew they weren't understanding it. We were not doing a great job explaining. The interest in AI now is off the charts. So that's the good part, right? That at least is the people are at the table looking to how do I leverage it. Second part is generative AI is actually excellent. Chat GPT may not be the answer for all the enterprise use cases. Now we're in the middle of our fundraising, and I can tell you the VC reaction is half and half. Half of them understand the difference between LLM and uh, what we do. Half of them don't. And uh, so that being uh, in tune with that now, the positive part is I would rather play in a world where everybody is interested and then figure out how to basically separate the wheat from the shaft. And I think the opportunity is fantastic. Everything is going to change, guaranteed. And we will stop reading about all the naysayers that humanity is going to end because of generative AI. It will not. And it will be fine. It will be fantastic. <laughs> That's 
awesome. And by the way, the investors, you know, we just heard that okay, they don't, they can't tell the difference. Not the investors who are on our panel now, but yes, so uh, no problem. But Marjorie, I mean, you had the same comment about like what you're seeing in your in the world of sales, etc. So you want to talk about that? Yeah, there's major FOMO right now going on with respect to Gen AI. So you know, there was getting good traction with our product that's in contact center. Contact center uh, products have done generally well, particularly through COVID and so forth, um, because call rates went up. You saw 300 to 800% increase in terms of the number of calls coming in with not that much growth in terms of the number of agents. And so what do you do when your contact center is stressing out? So we were, you know, we're already in a market that is looking for ways to optimize their contact center. As soon as we started adding generative AI and LLM and all these other terminologies and so forth within the emails that the SDRs were sending out, we saw like 50 to 60 percent increase in terms of the calls that we were getting. Like there were there were companies that were never taking our calls, and then all of a sudden, as soon as we sent out one email, boom, we got like a lead as a result of it. So it's it's pretty crazy. Now that being said. Um, I've instructed my team to make sure that whatever it is that we are developing with respect to generative AI applications, because there's so many different things that people are creating out there with unproven ROI. If they come to the table and say, look, I have this idea from a product perspective that we should develop, the questions I'm going to ask very simply are, who's the user, who are we targeting, and what is the ROI this thing is going to generate with respect to contact centers, right? Is it going to reduce after channel time? Is it going to reduce after call work? Is it going to reduce agent attrition? And if you can't answer those types of questions, I don't want to talk about it. I just don't. So, let's hear how else it is. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I'm actually going to share how we internally solve for your challenge. Uh, at some point, we realized we need to allocate some of our technical resources and the most important tools. So basically, what we did, we trained uh, a large language model on our FAQ, created a Discord bot, and we directed all the support directly into Discord dedicated channels. So technically, it's like still requires some some management and like some supervision, but it helped us a lot. And technically, all of our technical resources are like focusing on developing actual product. Well, wonderful. Alex, you also spoke about, you know, 70,000 customers, 161% user growth in one for month for 12 months. Like, what's, what's the magic and what role does AI and Gen AI have to play in? Uh, it actually, 85k should be right now. It's 185% month on month growth. Grow a little bit. 85, it's just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Grow a month on month. Uh, technically, I built the story behind this like pretty simple. We decided to focus on um, individual game developers uh, instead of just like selling to the game and series first because it's similar challenges to sell the product game. So, bottom of the top approach, we decided to find those communities and realize the community and we all post together in front of those marketplaces they have around 10 million effective users. So, we created the base version of our product for those marketplaces and launched the product game. It was pretty simple. We get access to the community without like, any spam in self marketing, like, without any dollar spam in self marketing. And is that a clean product or is that a premium product? Yeah, it's a premium model. But the majority of those indie developers they work for bigger enterprise corporations, and by having adoption of like, those indie guys, now we can get to those decision makers using game studios to sell them. Wonderful. So I know that um, uh, you know we kind of transition from how. We are using it internally to build our companies to actually how we are serving uh, customers. There was a question that came up earlier about intersection of different technologies. You know, I truly believe that we are sitting at a time where there's never been more of a confluence of the number of things that are changing, whether it's you know 5G, whether it's the metaverse, the question that was asked before, um, um, IoT and more. So how are you seeing those technologies come together, guys? Like metaverse and 5G and how do we design this? Yeah, so we envision um, games as actual future social networks and where people tend to create then play games, socialize, and express themselves in like a unique way. And technically, I feel the generative AI would help for the virtual world to be built with virtual content. So that's like how it's kind of like. 
Well, wonderful. I mean, yeah, let's go to you and how Gen AI plays in serving your customers. I mean, we spoke about how you say it in Dali. How does it play in serving your customers? And tell us a little bit more about what kind of products. So, um, as I mentioned before, we do family photography with uh, with generative AI, and the thing that we so give us an example. So the best way is actually just to to see it. It's actually very difficult to explain in words. The closest thing I can compare it to is kind of like having a journey for your kids. Um, but just come find me afterwards, and I'll just like actually show you the demo. It's much. It makes a lot more sense. Can we download it on iOS? Yes. Yes. We live on the app store. Live on the app store. It's on iOS. Yeah, it's on iOS and Android. You know. Um, and uh, what we realized was that you know everybody's seen Balenciaga. Though. You can obviously do some really incredible stuff. Um, but if you actually want to try to do something that looks like a real person, especially looks like your kids. You actually can't use existing models. You know, if you try to put baby photos into using existing models, they'll come out like this man with a beard. And the reason why is because those models are trained uh, on adults. If you think about it, they scrape the open internet, and that is 99.99% photos of adults. Um, now, we actually have one of the largest collections of baby photos. And um, because we had spent several years, building up a, a social network that was specifically for new parents wanting to share photos with family and not wanting to post any photos um, publicly on social media. And so we realized that we were sitting on an excellent proprietary data set. Uh, it's literally people who do not want to post these photos anywhere else and um, are specifically uploading them to Honeycomb. And so we were able to build our own proprietary model that was trained to work especially well for um, baby photos and young kids. And so that was kind of the key insight that we had. Of, you know, and I do think that right now there's a big debate going on uh, in, in generative AI of sort of the generalized approach versus the specialized approach and who is going to win. So um, I'm a believer in, I think, that focus and specialization right now is absolutely a, um, a, a moat and an advantage that you can build. And I think people who are looking at very specific use cases and building for the very deeply. Um, this is the moment uh, where you can turn a small lead into a very, very big lead uh, with a actually relatively small team. That's awesome. And when we talk about data, I mean, like how much do you need to, like how much is in the market? So do you want, you know, for the founders in the room that you want to sure. So for us, um, you know, we were able, we have over a million um, uh, baby photos, but you know, from the user experience side, which I think in consumer, where we are, is very, very important, uh, we've actually made it, we've had continuous improvements on how many photos a parent actually needs to add before you start getting really great results. So it started off, we thought, okay, maybe you're gonna have to add 100, then we got down to 45, then we got down to 25, and now we're down to 10. So with only 10 photos um, of your kid, you can start getting back some pretty amazing stuff um, with Honeycomb. And I think that's, you know, I think you are, that is only going to accelerate um, as this continues. Oh, awesome. Well, um, family photographs is a big thing, so yes, we um, can't wait to continue to dig deeper with your product. Come on, let's go to you. Your company has a tagline, hear this. If you can click, you can build an AI app, and that's what the tagline is. How many of you think that if you can click, you can build the app in that you're working on? Like, how many of you think that's a true statement? If you can, okay. So we have three people. We have four people in this room who believe that. So come on, come on, tell us. You will all be believers soon. <laughs> Actually, what we have built is. Uh, a low-code, no-code platform. It's all point and play. We raised about 12, 13 million <laughs> seed stage and three years went into really building that layer that allows you to actually, and plus we have classes, right? So in two to three hours, and some of you clearly were doing, clearly you're the smart ones. So in three hours, you can build your first machine learning app. Now, the next step is, where you want to take this thing is because one of our founders is actually a professor from MIT. He's been teaching actually in the computer science department for 18 years. A lot of training, it is all there for free. The intent is to make sure that we take everyone along, education and all. 
Now 6,000 people in the last few quarters, couple of quarters, from some of the largest companies have taken these classes. Half of them are BP level and above. So our ability to teach and actually get all these naysayers to build AI apps, that's the key. So reason I texted you uh, a couple of days back, you are great and well connected with all the women groups. And I want to make sure that as we build content around all the complex stuff, time series data and all that stuff, it's made available to everyone. Because it's, it, it, jobs are going to change. And you want to take everyone along with us. Well, phenomenal. They certainly follow up on that. And you have many, many champions here, both men and women in this room who are champions of this. But let's go to you. Um, how is Jenny I changing the whole contact center solutions? And how is it changing outcomes? You touched a little bit where you said, don't bring this to me until it changes outcomes. So, so talk to us about that and project out what you expect to see in the next year, two years, five years from now. Yeah, I think the, the way that it's impacted so far is that we've been able to, uh, well, first off, let me, let me say this, so we built our own large language model, 20 billion parameters, you know, have gone into it. So we focus a lot on building that up. It's our core technology, it's gonna, it's our differentiation in the market. And so we've been doing this now for, we built it up over five years, so it's been a very long journey. I've only been here for a part of it, but you know, I'm glad that that's in place because it is going to help us out with building a lot of the applications on on top. And the way I look at it is a lot of the, you know, a lot of the more recent developments has sped up our ability to make those impactful type of applications. So you can take something very easily like, let's say, summarization of a call, right? Okay, so I'm going to summarize an hour long call. Great. You could use, you know, you're like, okay, maybe I can use like. Um, open AI to be able to do that. Well, actually, I don't think you can because your accuracy level and trying to understand like what's actually really important on a call and how do I put in a format that's going to make sense across you know hundreds or thousands of customers who have different requirements in their contact center. I think that's it, it's an important thing where we've invested in that area to be able to do exactly those things. So I think it's you know to directly answer your question, I think it's sped up our ability to be able to hit those core, those very core use cases where before it was very rules based. So you'd go in there and say, okay, if I see this, this, and this, and spit out like almost like a mad day. So we, we, funny story, we had like a um, a GPT innovation day where we you know brought in a bunch of our customers and I actually put up a picture of Mad Lib and I said, this is the way that it was. You know, for those of you you know who grew up here in, in the states and know what Mad Libs are, you go in there and you fill out a verb or a noun, and sometimes you write really dirty things in there, and it's you know. It, come up like with really funny stories. But now, like the whole thing, the whole script, it's not just a mad look, like the whole thing is, is coming up using generative AI. And in the contact center, you know, everything from summarization to the ability to say, what should I say next on a call, right? To be able to listen to, you know, some of you may know this term, like the, the SIP, right? To be able to listen to the stream of the call and say, this is what should come next. And so those are some of the things where, in terms of where we're headed is, being able to actually provide guidance to agents to say, here's what you should say next, based on all of the past data from your contact center, by the way, of what good looks like, we should serve that up, and you should you know, use these prompts to be able to respond back to customers, because it will lead to an outcome. Whether it's a sales use case, because people think about contact center, they think, customer care, I have a problem with my iPhone, let me call the contact center. There's also a very large sales use case, what should I say next in order to close the deal? And so that's where I think, we're, we're going to add next. Yeah, and it's incredible to see just the step function change that you can drive in your solution. Certainly with virtualness, you know, we are an end-to-end platform that lets you design your digital code and it on the blockchain, associate with the rewards, you know, like you could have had a you know, digital code that lets you unlock your access to this event as an example, and be able to buy and sell without crypto. We actually started with thinking we had to have a design studio, thousands of 2D, 3D templates, completely changed because of Jenny I and we're opening up to like a hundred countries right now. And talking about global, Alex, I'd love to come to you. You know, you are visiting. You said how how long since you were have been in the Bay Area? For three weeks. Three weeks, okay? What's the difference? Like what are you seeing in terms of what you're seeing in the United States versus 
you know, the new come from. And we do have some global founders here. Also, we have someone from Dubai, someone from Tokyo. So I would love for you to see what you're seeing globally. So unfortunately, in Korea, we don't have like a proper education that's specific around machine learning. So majority of engineers are like self-starters, and it's limited to us like specifically in launching those ideas, like iterating on those ideas, and building actual companies. I'm excited to see how future is shaping up here directly in the area because everyone is talking about machine learning today. Everyone is talking about machine learning, and I'm excited about the number of ideas emerging here. Oh, that's awesome. And it's, it really struck me what you just said about the level of access. It really struck me. And I think both from the previous panel, the asset talking about you know, how uh, this can really equalize the playing field. Chris talked about how AI should help equalize the playing field as they come on. So it's really quite helpful. I would ask one more. Sorry, did you want yeah, I just wanted to say that on the one hand, since we don't have like, access, it's a, it's a challenge, but uh, we have those talents at really reasonable cost efficient price, so it's much more cost efficient to have team based like in Ukraine. So that's like a core advantage of Ukraine and that Amazing. If people want to know more about that, can I talk to you about it? Amazing. All right, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to open up to the audience. So get your questions ready. This came up in the previous panel as well. Regulatory implications, ethics. Um, maybe I'll start with you, given so we're talking about baby and baby pictures. How do you think about both of those factors in what you're very I will say that one of the things that we've learned is that the years of work that we put in beforehand have really paid off because from the very beginning with Honeycomb, we were all about creating a private place where you could upload photos and videos and we would use AI to transform those into stories of your child's life. And so um, just the fact that we had the years of work that we put into that tech from the beginning is, is really paying off now because uh, we've been able to get ahead on a lot of those things and all questions that we thought about and have kind of put into, into place. Um, I do have a very, I will say one of the things that I've learned is um, I actually had a conversation recently with um, a professor at Stanford Law, really right at the, tech, uh, at the intersection of tech um, and, and law right now. And he said, one of the things that is most exciting to me today is that this is the first time, he said, I'm, I'm old enough that I remember when the internet was starting. He's, and he said, since then, this is the first time where I've seen startups compete, really getting to compete with the big guys. And he said, I'm so excited for this environment. I'm so excited for the innovation that's happening. I can't wait to see all the things that are built. And he said, and I asked him, I had questions for him. I said, hey, but how, how much should you know, we be you know, worrying about like, you know, keeping up with it? I know that a lot of this stuff hasn't been written yet. He said, you know, it's going to take years to get it figured out. Like, it's going to get figured out, but it's going to take years. Go build. Go build. And I think that is, I think that is very true. Have no gates have sued you yet. What was that? No gates have sued them yet. <laughs> no lawsuits from gates have come up yet. Uh, no infants suing us yet, yes. <laughs> Do you want to add on the regulation and Yes. It will not catch up with AI for the next five to ten years, where things are going. Uh, there are a few things. When Elon Musk says, stop for six months, what he's saying is, oh my god, I was wasting time with Twitter when all this cool stuff was going on. Give me time to catch up. I think the thing to think about is, is let's do a test here. Can you all please share your bank account balance with me and please yell it out loud and be honest? Yes. <laughs> Anyone? We all have our sensibilities, right? And that's how we need to apply it to data as well. If you value something, don't put it on chat GPT. <laughs> Second part is what I'm really excited about and my comment initially about creating more billionaires who are women and other underrepresented parts is children. Most of the wealth is right now cornered by the same segment of people. 
this will unlock massive, and you're actually unlock massive opportunities with virtual bills. That's where we need to go. Regulation will catch up. And I'm telling you, the people who are supposed to be working on that have no idea. So all they come up with is generic stuff, but each one it needs to be very specific to the use case. Like in case of employment and hiring, they are very specific. When you dig into it, yes, there is bias, and there's very obvious way to actually address that. But even there, the regulators actually don't know what can be done. So there is a disparity that will not change for the next five to 10 years. I think for innovators, we should run as fast as we can. It's gold rush. All right, run as fast as you can is the gold rush. All right, so I'll, I'll have you know, just a few comments there for that. So on the, look, I mean, a part of this is like, just don't be an idiot when you're actually messing around with the data, right? So take care with it. So PII information, right? Personal identifiable information. Make sure you're not running that through uh, chat GPT. Make sure you're redacting that information even within your own models, right? Because you don't want to open up for potential for lawsuits down the road. So it's just, you know, use proper judgment. Just be careful with how you're building things out and just have that little bit layer of understanding. Even if you look at, you know, simple things like GDPR and so forth, like just take that into account as you're building these things out so that way you're not going to put yourself in harm's way, you know, a year, two years, three years down the road. When you do start putting these regulations, then you have to go and potentially undo all this within your within your models and your data because that's going to be way harder. No, oh, great. Um, what? Do you serve, does a company serve small, like SMBs, large Fortune 500? And I'd love to also get a comment from you, like which customer segment you serve? Yeah, uh, for, for ours, it's, you know, I would classify it as, you know, everywhere from like mid market and what we call emerging enterprise. So, you know, in, in the scale of like 100 million to about 2 billion and so forth. And, you know, that's, that's kind of been our, you know, roughly our sweet spot. but. You know, we're getting a lot of knocks on the door for ones that are much, much larger than that. And so it's about timing in terms of when you're gonna really go after that space. Do you have the right go to market go to market motion in place? You know, is your sales team well equipped to go do that? Do you have things like accessibility built in into your product, right? Data centers around the world. So in order for you to like actually go in there and tackle that, you gotta be set up in, in the right way to do so. Uh, medium to large and some in regulated industries. Uh, can we address your product um, users from across the world? What's the distribution in the US and outside of the US? Uh, so most of our users are based in the US, but we do actually have quite a few users across the globe, and that's because one of the big reasons people will use an e-commerce is to stay in touch with family, um, who in today's day and age is very rare. You know, we're all living in the same place. My family's in Texas, my co-founder's family is in Singapore and New Jersey. And um, so, yes, we definitely do have uh, users across the globe, but I will say um, majority here in the US. Okay, and Alex, um, both the regulatory perspective, the ethical perspectives, as well as we'd love to understand, is your business predominantly global? global? Hey, it's also global. We have lots of customers from the United States, all the Nordics, like uh, European Union, there are slightly different situation there, and Asia as well. So it's also spread out across the global. Anything on the regulatory ethics side that you think about as you're building the company? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I think like data protection, consent, um, transparency in terms of like, using the data is like, super important and crucial for actually shaping up the future of the narrative AI and like, its adoption in the future. And like, not that concerned from, like, on our side because we use our proprietary models and our proprietary data. So, and we tend to roll out those features in the client side. So it's not like that significant effect on us. Great. All right, let's open up. Let's open up for questions. What questions do we have? Yes. Uh, and I can run the mic. Package up. All right. Uh, question to everyone, but I think mostly for you, Alex, and thank you for coming here. It's a crazy time there. Uh, what do you think? How close do you think we are um, creating video assets that are accurate for simulation, for creating modeling, and not just beautiful video assets? My first guy would be like, 
a year, year and a half from now to get the production level quality assets. And I built a generated jet geometry, even like these materials and other static geometry is super serious, like super limited use case. So that basically if you generate a refrigerator, you should go open a door of the refrigerator. So we definitely bring in animation of roughly one year to year and a half. How is the rising interest rate affecting all of you guys? And uh, what would you, what's your action plan for if they rise further or if there's more pain? Like, it's kind of tangential to tech, but it, I think it affects all of you guys, right? No issue. No. Yeah, you know, um, I think maybe more broadly, we can also talk about how we're thinking about our fundraising strategies. Um, and so, you already mentioned you're in fundraising board, so maybe come and we'll start with this. Uh, I think amongst the VCs, the frenzy and interest in AI is already there. So we thought it'll be materialized in six months, it's already there, so non issue. They all are sitting on a lot of money. And you're also seeing announcements of new funds being raised and closed, so not an issue. There's plenty of money out there. Yeah, I think it goes back to some of the things that the earlier panel highlighted. You know, are you solving a real problem, a big problem, do you have a differentiated approach? Um, and you know, can you tell that story? Uh, and if you can do that, then you know, there's always money for the right things, uh, is I guess how I would put it. Thank you for your time today. I have a question for call center AI, because I feel like right now it's almost like a necessity for enterprise. So I'm curious, what are some of the core factors when the either an SMB or enterprise decides to purchase or not, and what is some of the pain point when it uh, you know goes to market to reach certain scale that you're hoping for? Yeah, so if I answer, if I heard the question correctly, like what are, what are some of the issues that we like we are running into, or SMBs and enterprises are running into? Oh, some of the issues. Okay, so yeah, some of the issues that, so I mean, if I look at um, a lot of it is actually right now is a, it's a budget competition issue more than anything else um, across the board. And you know, I think everyone in software is probably feeling that. So every CFO right now is squeezing each of their teams and their line items to say, like, is this necessary? Is this necessary? My previous company went through like across the board and we cut, you know, we cut off hundreds of dollars, you know, over a million dollars in. You know, just software. Some we were actually using. We still had to like we had to cut it out because we had to get to the EBITDA numbers that we were shooting for. So I think very similar in contact center. I think more specifically is can you can you prove out where where we think we'll win? And I think uh, you know some others as well is can you tie it to the ROI, the average channel time reduction, as an example. So for example, very clearly if you can reduce the average. Uh, like after call work, as an example, you have an agent that spends five minutes on writing up a note at the end. What if that became three minutes or no minutes afterwards and they can take more calls? So then I would then use the number of agents I have in the contact center. So it's just being able to justify, um, you know, the spend that they're going to go with you to, you know, being going to buy you versus buying somewhere else. So how can you just best justify it and tie it to something they really care about? Um, thank you very much for the uh, insights today. Regarding regulatory environment, is that to be feared? Is that to help your path to profitability or have the path to scaling? Just maybe two or three views to talk about the regulatory schemes coming up in the discuss. I can comment on that. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Overall, for the society and for all of us, it's a good thing to get into it and have more oversight now or whenever it materializes than later and it will only police some of the stuff sooner my personal opinion is Sarvin Northley is a very good example when you start putting white collar crime in jail and CFOs and CFO, CEOs are accountable for what their company does and reports immediately you will have magical impact on the control around AI yeah.
And so I, I mean, I would echo that, and I actually just saw some text about even on the crypto side, Congress passing some, some new regulation. As long as there's clarity, it really opens up you know, um, and speeds up the pace of innovation. And um, I would say, again, just use common sense, um, and that will take you 80% of the way in making sure you're doing things right in a strong sort of Did you have a comment? Sorry. I think there was a question. So. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Preeti. Uh, my question is, what is your vision for your company, each of you, the next three years from now? You know, that's a, that's a great question, and we call that our last question because we're also out of time. It's a fantastic <laughs> question to close on, and then, of course, our speakers will be there uh, as well. Alex, why don't you start? Yeah, absolutely. So, we think about Zebra as uh, Kind of our we do basically creating all type of 3D assets with like rigging with animation with textures. That would be a vision for the next three years. Yeah. I think the mic stopped working. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. one more time. All right, one more time. All right, that stopped working. All right, it started. You know, by the way, I think the mic stayed remarkably well the second time. Yeah. Yeah. So, to the first time. yeah, so we're just saying that basically Zebra would be like into this like kind of for 2D assets, basically in all type of production ready 3D models with rig with like animation with textures. So that's our plan for the next three years. I'll keep it brief. Without observing you can't render your contact center with respect to the con the, the intelligence layer. So everything being powered by essentially what Observe is doing, whether it's before a call, during a call, after a call, post-call, after you're doing the analysis, you essentially need that layer to power not just the after-the-call interaction to make your agents better and your products and services better, but also actually powering the interaction itself and making that interaction much, much smarter. So we started Honey Come for our own kids and families. It just comes from a pretty personal place. Um, but our vision is really to enable anybody to take their family's um, story from ordinary to extraordinary. And you don't need to be a professional photographer, videographer, documentarian to make that happen. You know, what if we could take your everyday photos and turn them into the story of someone's life um, and do it pretty magically? So in words of Guy Kawasaki, who is evangelist for Apple, let a thousand flowers bloom. So I think with Ikigai Labs, we expect like hundreds of use cases being uh, solved through our platform. I think it'll be a fantastic next three to five minutes. Yeah. That's an awesome and I'm not on much less. Um, you know, to give uh, creators, fans, just distribution and the ability to connect with fans across the globe. Do we still have Tiffany in the room? Is Tiffany still here? Yes, Tiffany. Tiffany's at the back, okay? She's a creator or a disability activist. If you don't already like, follow, subscribe, please follow her. And there are 300 million creators like that and wide platforms like, you know, Facebook. So it gave a huge distribution platform. Is still lacking, and that's what we want to solve with uh, virtualness, and that's what I see. Generally, we are just helps us accelerate that journey. So, with that, a huge thank you, Sonia um, and uh, Inventive Group, and let's give that a amazing practice of